I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and paying my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. My name is Ben Bland, and I'm a research fellow at the Institute here in Sydney. Thank you for joining us today for this important discussion about the darkening clouds over Hong Kong. Last month, Beijing announced that it would unilaterally implement national security legislation in Hong Kong. This move deals a heavy blow to the city's freedoms and its autonomy, and it comes after years of intensifying pressure and the unprecedented protests of 2019. With thousands of democracy activists already arrested in the last year, and Beijing's interventions becoming ever more intrusive, is this the end of Hong Kong as we know it? To discuss this question, we're joined from Hong Kong by three insightful panelists who've been at the heart of the action in their own different ways. Firstly, we have Dennis Kwok. Dennis is a practicing barrister and a pro-democracy member of Hong Kong's Legislative Council. Dennis has actually been targeted by Chinese officials for disqualification, but for now he's still in LegCo and fighting on for democracy. Secondly, we have Bonnie Leung. Bonnie is a democracy activist and a member of the Civil Human Rights Front. And Bonnie played a key role in organizing the massive peaceful protests last year against the controversial extradition bill in Hong Kong. Last, but by no means least, we have Su Lin Wong. Su Lin has been covering events on the ground in Hong Kong for the Financial Times, as well as reporting extensively across southern China. And Su Lin will be joining The Economist next month, so we catch her genuinely between jobs, but in the good way. Um, before we get going, some housekeeping. You can submit questions via the Q&A button. We'll gather them and respond to as many as we can later in the event. And please do include your name and any affiliation when you send through your questions. First up, I want to go to you, Dennis, and ask you a bit about this new national security legislation. Yeah. Many other countries around the world have similar laws, as the Chinese government has re repeatedly pointed out. So why is this proposal so concerning for Hong Kong? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for organizing this event. It's an honor to be here. Um, the constitutional structure of uh, uh, the Hong Kong SAR um, on the one country, two system is that we are supposed to make our own laws. Uh, and especially with uh, national security law, uh, under Article 23 of the basic law, we are supposed to legislate on our own uh, with regards to laws like subversion, secession, um, so the fact that they are now making this law in Beijing with almost zero input from the Hong Kong people by passing all our institutions and the Legislative Council. Uh, and we're basically, I have to read about what is going to be in this law in, from the newspaper. Um, no one knows for sure, even if you ask the government or the NPC delegates from Hong Kong, they have no idea what's exactly going to be in this law. And they threaten to uh, impose this law on Hong Kong by the end of this month. So um, this is uh, the number one concern. I, I think, in my view, this, this would be the end of one country, two systems. If they can enact laws like that, they wouldn't stop at national security. It would be uh, national education next month and then something else uh, 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 the other. Um, so I think uh, 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 the, the implications, as uh, has been we've seen from the uh, international international community, uh, is that uh, everyone with with the right mind see this as the uh, end of one country, two systems. If they are going to do it this way, and you know, uh, I don't have to tell you how they have interpreted national security uh, in the mainland. It could uh, include anything from uh, education, uh, saying the wrong things. Uh, financial risk um, to uh, uh, other issues that could broadly come within mm -hmm. national security. It could include lawyers who are defending uh, human rights activists uh, who's been accused of uh, subverting national security. So the concept is very wide. We don't know what they're going to put in the law and uh, they're bypassing completely the uh, uh, Hong Kong institutions. And we know that Hong Kong has had an obligation under the basic law, which is the city's mini constitution, to bring in some sort of national security legislation ever since the handover from British control in 1997. But Su Lin, I, I want to ask you, after so many years, why do you think that Beijing, the Chinese government, is pushing this national, national security law now? What's happened 
recently? Is this because the world's attention is on other problems? Is this a response to last year's protests? What's motivating Beijing? So I was at a press conference held by China's foreign ministry in Hong Kong last week. And this very question was asked. And the official answer was that China's annual parliamentary meeting just happened. And so this was the first opportunity to pass such a uh, decision to, to enact this kind of law. But unofficially, I've been speaking to uh, mainlanders in uh, the mainland who work on Hong Kong, and they all say that now is the moment, uh, the, the time couldn't possibly be uh, more right. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, namely that the world is distracted with coronavirus. So there's a sense amongst um, the CCP and in Beijing that, that um, there'll be less scrutiny about what is going on right now regarding uh, China's passing of national security legislation for Hong Kong. And then secondly, what I'm hearing from uh, mainland officials is that the US-China relationship is going from bad to worse. And so now might as well, um, they might as well try and, and pass laws that are going to make the West unhappy um, because there isn't that much to lose regarding uh, just how bad tensions are between the US and China. And Silin, do you think there's also an extent to which Beijing genuinely believed that last year's protests were a threat to national security, that this was really subversion and there was a risk of separatism, etc. And the only way, from its perspective, to secure uh, you know, the nation and unity of China was by bringing in this sort of swinging crackdown on Hong Kong. Yes. So one of the most extraordinary things about covering the Hong Kong protests has been just how differently Hong Kong, as I speak to, view the protests versus um, the pro-Beijing camp and uh, mainland officials. So I think that for most Hong Kong, as I speak to, this is very much a pro-democracy movement. And it's about Hong Kongers wanting the right to elect their own leaders in Hong Kong. But for mainland officials and from the official Beijing narrative, this has been very much framed as an independence movement and about foreign interference and the CIA and MI6 meddling in um, the so-called internal affairs of, of China. Um, and so I think because the framing is so different, um, it has uh, caused a, a lot of... Um, problems and in some ways it's like very extraordinary that there is such a clash um, and, and in, in some ways that is at, gets to the very very heart of the problem and I think that's why across the political spectrum um, whether I'm speaking to frontline protesters or pro-Beijing um, the pro-Beijing camp in Hong Kong or, or mainland government officials there's this sense of hopelessness um, this deep deep sense of hopelessness across the board. And going back to you, Dennis, on this point, I mean, in the end, is this just a clash of, of values, a clash of, of political systems that the Chinese Communist Party with its Marxist Leninist view of the world could never really accept the sort of liberal democratic values that, that Hong Kong has embraced? Was it inevitable that this, this one country, two systems arrangement would fall apart? You know, um... We all know from the beginning that one country, two system is an inherent contradiction. And it, only, it will only work if there is a respect between the two systems. Uh, that is to say that um, we know Hong Kong is different uh, and we will respect uh, uh, that the values and the systems in Hong Kong are different from the mainland and vice versa. But once they tear down that respect of the difference and only emphasize on one country, um, you hear from mainland officials saying all the time in the past few years that one country is bigger than two systems. Uh, one country trumps two systems. Now, if they insist on that mentality, they are uh, not only deviating from the original idea that was uh, um, founded by Deng Xiaoping, but um, that the, the, the two system, if there's no respect between the two difference, the dif differences between the two systems, then it's never going to work. And you, you see it now that they are basically saying, okay, enough is enough. Um, we are, we, our patients have run out. You, uh, uh, 
you know, they keep saying that you've crossed the red line or the bottom line of the central people's government. So that's why we're doing this and this. But they never bothered to think about the bottom line of the Hong Kong people. Um, you know, we've waited for 23 years for democracy. They keep saying that, well, we, we waited for 23 years for you to enact this national security law. But we've also waited for uh, uh, the central people's government to honor its promise to the Hong Kong people uh, for universal suffrage. And that has never been uh, honored. And now they say, even to the international community, that the Sino-British Joint Declaration is uh, just a piece of paper, that th there's no obligation, no promise uh, arising from it. Uh, and that uh, the British government should just back off. This is how they see their obligation under the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And Bonnie, I, I want to come to you next. I know that you were quite influential in your NGO too in organizing the huge protest last year against the extradition bill, which would have, for the first time, allowed people to be extradited from Hong Kong to mainland China. It seems to me that national security law is a much bigger threat to Hong Kong, and yet we haven't really seen the sort of huge mass protests that we saw last year against this national security legislation. Why haven't more Hong Kongers been on the streets protesting now? Um, actually, once the national security uh, legislation was announced, there were uh, uh, several uh, smaller protests uh, organically uh, organized by uh, different organizations or individuals or netizens. And uh, there were remarkable uh, participants, uh, hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of people showed up in the streets despite uh, the possible legal consequences or uh, even physical danger uh, because of police brutality. Um, uh, however, as you've said, yes, uh, compared to last year, where uh, at most two million people took to the streets to protest against uh, uh, the, the extradition bill, why in this year we haven't seen it yet? Uh, there are several reasons. One of the reasons is that um, uh, because now we are in the middle of pandemic, and even though in Hong Kong uh, now we contain the virus quite well, and there are uh, few local infections, and uh, schools are about to be reopened, uh, and also beauty salon cinemas are, are already reopened. So the, the danger of pandemic is not very serious, but the government refused to relax the social distancing regulations. That it was uh, why uh, whenever people applying for, uh, for permission to have protest, the police would refuse it. And uh, they just refused uh, the June 4th massacre ceremony that Hong Kong people had held for 30 years last uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, but people still uh, persist to going out to do it anyway, regardless of the regulations that uh, the police try to impose on us. So it shows that uh, the, the momentum of the movement is still there and Hong Kong people are still persisting in uh, fighting for our freedom and uh, fighting for our human rights and fighting against uh, the uh, evil law that uh, the, is the national security law. Uh, but if the, um, uh, the protests are going to be illegal, uh, I think it is uh, quite a bit of challenge for uh, people to, uh, with millions of people actually will be able to go out because the police can easily have the excuse to disperse the people with tear gas and they would start to, to arrest people uh, at quite an early stage. So it is difficult. Uh, but people are uh, continuing the movement uh, the best ways we can. And as you said, Bonnie, yesterday there were thousands of people defying the government and the police uh, to remember the victims of the massacre in Tiananmen Square 31 years ago when uh, Chinese democracy activists were cracked down on in a very harsh manner. People were, were remembering that solemnly in Hong Kong with candlelit vigils across the city, not one big vigil as, as there normally has been in the past because of these COVID-19 restrictions. But do you think we'll ever see these big Tiananmen Square memorial vigils again? Or with the national security law, is that basically it? That moment has passed. Um, I have to say, uh, once the, the uh, legislation is announced, I believe all the demands of the, uh, of the uh, June 4th massacre ceremony scream trouble because uh, the vigils demands are uh, demanding 
democracy in China and of one party ruling and release uh, political prisoners in China. So it's all screams trouble if the law is enacted. Uh, so uh, there is a danger, but at the same time, I have confidence in Hong Kong people. As we had already shown yesterday, uh, despite the regulations, uh, Hong Kong people are still very brave. We go out regardlessly. And the organizer of the vigil as well said that they will continue uh, not shy away from, from uh, all the threats and decided to continue and persist on uh, the demands that uh, Hong Kong people had been holding for over 30 years. So um, I believe that uh, if the suppress is going to be bigger in the future, uh, it will certainly in some way alter Hong Kong people's behavior. But if we are not no longer allowed to uh, light our candles inside of Victoria Park, just like yesterday, we would light our candles all across the territory uh, uh, in the streets and in the churches and wherever we can uh, uh, just protest. So um, it really will be a danger that we can no longer uh, with hundreds of thousands of people gather in Victoria Park to memorize the victims, but uh, there will be vigils nonetheless. And even before the national security law, we've all already seen, I think, more than 8,000 mostly young people arrested in the last year um, for participating in the pro-democracy protests. Um, Hong Kong police have even been arresting school children in their uniforms. I mean, what sort of impact has this crackdown already had on, on people and Hong Kong society, Bonnie? Can you, you tell us you've spent time on the front lines? How, how are people feeling when they see their neighbours who are police officers arresting school kids, they see thousands of young people, their lives potentially ruined by prison sentences or prosecutions? Um, I think it's uh, extremely sad for us uh, to see uh, school children uh, being arrested, especially I believe it is quite obvious now how the police uh, try to so-called enacting the law. They target young people and uh, they target uh, people, uh, even politicians or uh, sometimes restaurants owners, uh, businessmen who openly support the, uh, the movement. And now we have something called the yellow economy for uh, restaurants and shops who uh, openly support the movement. And they're also the targets of police too. Uh, so it is extremely sad and it is very obvious to us now that uh, whenever you go out to protest, however peaceful you are, there could be danger that you might be arrested. So uh, what Hong Kong people are doing now is that we try our best to support all the people who have been arrested. We donate money to them and a lot of uh, professional like lawyers, Dennis, must know that they're trying their best to uh, represent uh, the people who are arrested and also prosecuted. And of course, the influence on themselves and on their families would be a uh, 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 very grief because uh, now we have seen reports and analysis that uh, especially the young people are facing a lot of mental pressure and uh, uh, the, the numbers of depression and anxiety and post-traumatic uh, uh, problem are on the rise. So it is a real danger, but Hong Kong people are trying our best to help. And what's impressive is that as far as uh, I mentioned that uh, especially the young people are under a lot of pressure, but when you go out to the streets, whenever the protests happen, there are still a large number of Hong Kong people, especially young people are still persisting. So I think it is extremely remarkable. I wanna explore this human side of the story a bit more because outside Hong Kong, we see a lot of dramatic images last year of, of protests and clashes. We now hear a lot about Beijing and China pushing its weight around, um, but we don't hear so much about the people and why they're really doing this. Um, Su Lin, I know you've spent a lot of time with the frontliners last year who were clashing with the police, risking years in jail, serious injury, even death, right? I know that some, some young people went to the protests with their last will and testament in their pocket, which is really quite poignant uh, in terms of what they have at stake. But what's, what's motivating these young people to risk so much in 
fighting for these abstract values of freedom and democracy. I mean, we throw these words around all the time, but, but these guys are willing to, to fight and die for those values. I mean, what, what's that really about? I think that's one of the reasons why the Hong Kong protests really have, have captured uh, the world because um, there, there's this narrative that young people are really disengaged all over the world now from politics. And yet what the 2019 Hong Kong protest showed is that um, there, was, uh, there were thousands, tens of thousands of, of Hong Kongers and particularly young Hong Kongers who were not disengaged and who were not apathetic and who were willing to, to go out um, and as you say, some were, uh, you know, at some at great costs um, to to fight for freedoms like um, to, to fight for their freedoms and for democracy. Um, I think for a lot of the frontliners and young people I spoke to last year, they grew up um, under a, an education system that really encouraged them to think critically to engage um, and uh, to think about what kind of future they wanted and what kind of system they wanted to, to live under. And I think that as China has tightened its control of mainland China um, and also Hong Kong in recent years, there's been this real um, sense of horror that the future of Hong Kong is going to um, if, uh, if not become, but at least really resemble um, the situation in mainland China, where there is no freedom of protest, there's no freedom of assembly, there's no freedom of religion, there's no freedom of the press, there's no freedom of speech. And these are all freedoms that Hong Kongers enjoy. Um, and so I think for a lot of the frontline protesters, um, they really wanted to protect those freedoms and they felt like... Um, democracy was, was the way to do that. Unfortunately, um, that, has, that avenue has been shut off to them. Um, and so they thought, well, taking to the streets is a way for us to express our discontent if we can't express our discontent at the ballot box. But as the protest continued last year, um, we saw the police and the government clamp down on these peaceful street protests that Bonnie and Dennis were involved with, um, where one million people took to the streets or even two million people took to the streets. And so in a way, um, I think that radicalised some of the frontline protesters. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this really is um, a pro-democracy movement. But as um, the authorities clamped down, what I noticed was that more and more young people and more and more people on the streets started calling for um, Hong Kong independence. Um, and so I think the protest really evolved last year um, in reaction to how the Hong Kong government and how Beijing were acting. And so um, it, it, it's really become something, uh, it, it, for some sectors of the protest movement, it has become something quite different. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not, really sure. I, I think there are some people who feel that Hong Kong is inevitably going to become just another mainland Chinese city because the two other options uh, seem implausible. Those two other options being Hong Kong independence or uh, Hong Kong outliving the Chinese Communist Party the way Eastern Europe outlived the Soviet Union. But I think for a small group of more radical protesters in Hong Kong, um, there is there has been a radicalization and there is a sense uh, they, they want to continue escalating. And so there's more and more talk of um, the risk of Hong Kong becoming the new Belfast or we're going to see um, the sort of um, replication of, of what we saw in Northern Ireland where we see small groups um, taking much more radical actions like for example, trying to set off bombs. So, Dennis, I want to take that point up uh, with you. I mean, do you worry about the normalization of violence um, within the democracy movement? Because last year it struck me that, you know, early on, a lot of the moderate Democrats, um, your colleagues, were criticizing the violence, but then they sort of came to accept it and say, well, what do you expect when you, you squeeze young people? But it seems there has been a normalization of violence on 
all sides in a way. And as Sulin was suggesting, it does seem like we might be heading into this dangerous spiral into more and more conflict. So does that concern you? Um, you know, I, I think if you look at what happened in the past two weeks, um, most protests in uh, assembly are, are peaceful. Uh, it is the police that is using the excessive force in uh, uh, arresting hundreds, uh, as you said, even students in their uniforms are being uh, pushed to a police uh, car and arrested. And um, I, I think there is this um, sense of solidarity between um, uh, uh, the, the Hong Kong people, amongst the Hong Kong people. Um, um, for those of us who call for peaceful protests like myself, uh, we understand that um, you know, there are, there are uh, radical elements in the uh, uh, protest movements that would resort to uh, uh, violence from time to time. And we try to tell them not to do that, but we're not gonna sever our ties with them uh, because just because they're doing something that we don't necessarily 100% approve of. Um, and there is this uh, solidarity you see um, in the district council election last year, um, even though at, that was the height of um, uh, what you say that, you know, that there's a lot of uh, uh, obstruction violence uh, happening. And I think the pro Beijing camp was hoping to capitalize on that, to, hoping that um, the Hong Kong people would be so sick and tired of all that, that they would actually vote uh, 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 for the pro Beijing camp. But it turned out not uh, to be the case. And we had a land, landslide victory. And I think that tells you how the people of Hong Kong think about the whole uh, situation is that, yes, they may not like or approve of the violence that some protesters have uh, caused, but they uh, even disapprove even more uh, the police brutality and the fact that there is no check and balance and there is no way in holding the police accountable for their actions on the streets. I think that is a bigger concern for most Hong Kong people. And I think when I was living in Hong Kong, it struck me, and I think a lot of outsiders have the same feeling, that the more that Beijing was squeezing Hong Kong, the more it was simply deepening and strengthening the resistance movement and this sense of a separate Hong Kong identity that Su Lin was referring to. But, but Dennis, I wonder, what, why can't Beijing see this? Why can't it see that its crackdowns just make its end goals further and further away? Why, why I guess, can't the Chinese government just leave Hong Kongers alone? Because Ben, I'm afraid you're thinking like a Westerner. Um, you are, uh, you're thinking like, you know, uh, uh, how we think, like logically, you know, why would China do this to Hong Kong when it needs Hong Kong as a financial center or that um, Hong Kong really should, should be left alone and thrive uh, on, on its uh, uh, freedom and liberal values? Because I think for an authoritarian regime, there's never going to be enough control. There's never going to be enough power. Uh, and we, 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 we see this increasingly assertive authoritarianism that is uh, uh, clouding over Hong Kong and the rest of the world is also feeling it. Why, uh, why are they making threats again, uh, against Australian beef and uh, wine? Why are they uh, adopting this wolf warrior uh, diplomacy if there's you know, an absurd term, more absurd than this. I don't know, a wolf warrior diplomacy, threatening this country, threatening this, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, this country, and, um, and, you know, threatening Taiwan for uh, reunification by non-peaceful means. I, I think this, you have to read all of this together uh, and see China as it is today. And I think it is really showing its true colors. To, to the world. And uh, used to be 10 years ago, they still pay lip service to, oh, human rights, you know, we're getting there, rule of law, yes, we get it. But now they're not paying any lip service anymore. They're saying, this is who we are. If you don't like it, uh, then uh, get out of our way uh, or not. We're going to threaten you with consequences and consequences. Uh, and that's the same as happening to Hong Kong. And, and in, in, a, in a sad way, you're an example of that, right, Dennis? Because a few years ago, I think Beijing would have seen you as a moderate pro-democracy politician. Um, you know, perhaps they would have been reaching out to you. But in the last few months, they've sort of identified you as an enemy of the state, accused you of abusing your power and all sorts of things. And there's a campaign underway to, to disqualify you from the legislative council. So I guess you found yourself sort of on the front line of that shift in Beijing's perspective to see a much 
broader range of enemies, as it were, whereas before they were much more targeted. Yeah, I, I fully expected myself to be disqualified uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the next round of elections. Uh, if there is going to be a next round of elections, but they're just not just targeting me. Uh, I mean, mainstream moderate uh, Democrats like Martin Lee uh, or Dr. Margaret Ng have been arrested for uh, uh, you know unauthorized assembly, and they're going after them. Uh, not for you know, usually you, you get a fine or something if you go for an unauthorized assembly, but they're going after them for incitement or uh, and they try to uh, you know bring more serious charges against them. Um, so, yes, the whole strategy of Beijing has changed. I don't care whether you're Martin Lee or Joshua Wong. Uh, we're going to go after you the, the whole lot. You're, you're basically branded as the same thing. And I, it's clear that Beijing has changed its tack, but I think Hong Kongers have changed how they see China too. I want to come to you next, Bonnie, because we know that after the handover in 1997, a lot of Hong Kongers actually embraced uh, the return to the mainland. We can see this in survey data that up to around 2008, there was a peak of Hong Kongers feeling proud to be part of China. But why have Hong Kongers changed the way they, they feel about the mainland from maybe welcoming it, to return to indifference, to now increasing resentment, hatred, anger? Well, I think it is a very good question uh, because uh, I believe before or right after the handover, Hong Kong people who stayed in Hong Kong uh, believe and have confidence in the one country, two system. And when uh, the one country, two system only would work if Beijing would exercise the self-restraint, leave our businesses to our businesses, uh, leave what is promised in the basic law uh, to give Hong Kong government high degree of autonomy, which basically means everything except for uh, foreign affairs and uh, security issues. So uh, for the first few years, it works pretty well. We have from time to time faced some danger, uh, but it was pretty good. So we still feel our freedom. We still feel our human rights be protected. But Actually, ever since 2003, when uh, uh, Hong Kong government tried, as Dennett has said earlier, that Article 23 uh, actually imposed an obligation on the Hong Kong government to uh, locally legislate for national security. And from that bill drafted, we already see that uh, Beijing is trying to have a tighter grip on Hong Kong, which would undermine our human rights and our freedom. And from that day on, Hong Kong people started uh, uh, gradually to feel more and more danger, more and more grabs from Beijing. And uh, from 2000 and year, uh, 2003 year on, we see more uh, influence from Beijing, like our education. Uh, we see that they try to impose uh, brainwashing education, uh, something like what's happening in China to impose on Hong Kong students. Or we see that they're trying to meddling with our, with our media agencies. So more and more danger we sense. Hong Kong people are starting to feel less and less secure and more willing to come out to protest. So what we've seen last year was not just about the extradition bill itself, but years and years of built on pressure and built on danger that Hong Kong people sense that's led us to uh, feel that we know we, we can uh, accept it no more and we need to fight. And so, uh, uh, and you mentioned about 2008. Uh, at that point, Hong Kong people still, uh, if we're not uh, totally be proud of the Olympic Games, at least we don't uh, uh, feel much hatred about it or uh, uh, young people would not refuse to uh, go out for celebrations or something like that. Uh, however, now, as Sulin said earlier, uh, the more suppressed we feel, especially for the young people, the more they are reluctant to accept that they are Chinese, but more uh, identify themselves as Hong Kong, and more people would mention something like Hong Kong independence. So it's really about more uh, suppression 
the more we fight against and emotionally distance ourselves from China. So uh, if China care at all about Hong Kong people's feelings and care about at all Hong Kong people's, especially the next generation's loyalty to the country, they really should not touch our internal businesses as promised in the basic law. But as they really do not care about Hong Kong people, only they care about their grips of power and earn more power, earn more control over the territory to use our system. Uh, for their businesses or for their capital flow instead of really care about the people living in the city. So that's why that, that explains their behavior. Well, talking of their grip on power, I, I want to explore a bit the impact of the crackdowns on Hong Kong's role as a global financial center. Um, in the last few days, several leading Western companies, including HSBC, Standard Chartered, Jardines and Swire have all come out publicly in support of the national security legislation, even though the details of the law haven't actually been released yet. And it's not really clear if they're doing this because they think the national security law is the best thing since sliced bread, or if they feel somehow pressured by the authorities to do it. So Su Lin, you, know, you used to work for the Financial Times, you've covered the business sector in Hong Kong and China. I mean, do you think that business can just carry on as usual? Um, or in the end, are Beijing's increasing encroachments going to undermine the very foundations of Hong Kong's success as a global financial center, which is probably the rule of law, uh, individual liberties, maybe to, to a lesser extent? I think Beijing has always really admired the so-called Singapore model and has had aspirations for Hong Kong to become Singapore. Um, and a lot of uh, Hong Kong um, uh, political analysts I speak to say that Beijing's understanding of one country, two systems is actually one country, two economic systems. And it's not really about um, granting Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy and the civic freedoms that, that we've been speaking about um, today. Um, and so I think that for a lot of businesses who have dealings in the mainland, um, they are hoping they will be able to continue on uh, as normal. Um, or you know, it may be actually uh, the proposed national security law might calm things down in Hong Kong because Beijing will then be able to clamp down on, on the protests um, and things will return to a so-called normal. Uh, the, the question is, can Hong Kong become Singapore or is Hong Kong um, the international city it is because of its civic freedoms and because of its high degree of autonomy and can business um, continue to flourish here uh, without the freedoms that, that we've seen Hong Kong enjoy um, previously. So I think what we're seeing right now with um, HSBC and Standard Charter and Jardines and Swire all coming forward to, to make uh, uh, statements in favour of the proposed legislation is is really a manifestation of this age-old conflict of, of um, principles versus profits. Um, and because uh, China is now the largest consumer market globally, I think for a lot of these businesses, um, they they have they they've chosen profits. Um, and I actually think one other point on this is if there is a global significance of the Hong Kong protests um, last year, it really was um, the extent to which uh, the Chinese Communist Party now has um, influence over countries and businesses globally. And the fact that for a lot of these businesses and, and countries, um, they have to make a choice now. Um, and so we saw all kinds of businesses get caught up in the Hong Kong protests last year, the MBA, Apple, Tiffany's, um, video games companies. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more examples of that going forward. Yeah, I think that's partly probably what's happening in Australia too, this, this sense that it's, it's very hard to play both ends now and there's a pressure increasingly from, from China, but also from, from other governments too, to, to choose. And I mean, on that point, I think we've got to um, look at what the Trump administration has been doing because... They've said that with the, the new national security legislation, Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous to justify its special treatment under US law. 
as a separate customs territory. And of course, it's a fool's errand predicting what President Trump's actually going to do about this or anything else for that matter. Um, but Dennis, as, as a lawmaker, and I know you've visited the US to lobby on these issues, do you support the US government sanctioning China and Hong Kong? Or do you think in the end that this sort of approach is just going to punish Hong Kong people even more and the Communist Party won't really care? Well, at the end of the day, the Hong Kong Policy Act is uh, an act of the uh, US uh, uh, Congress uh, granting special privilege to Hong Kong because it has one country, two systems. Now, we've, I've been warning the Hong Kong government and uh, 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 the Central People's Government, look, the message two years ago when I, I started uh, visiting uh, the United States, talking to different people there, it is very clear that if they continue down this path of uh, so-called one country systems policy, uh, if they continue to uh, disqualify uh, pro-democracy uh, uh, candidates, uh, evicting journalists, um, uh, delaying uh, the pace of democracy and uh, forcing the enactment of Article 23, which is happening now, they will lose the, 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 the special status under the Hong Kong Policy Act. And that is just a natural consequence of uh, their policy. And it is happening now and happening fast. So they really have no one else to blame but themselves for uh, continuing down this path. Now, maybe it is the case that Beijing don't care, uh, that um, you know, they, they see Hong Kong, uh, they don't need the support or, or international recognition anymore for Hong Kong. And if Hong Kong becomes just like Shanghai or, or, or Shenzhen, then so be it. Uh, they could take that uh, uh, hit. And in fact, uh, the bankers and uh, the uh, corporate lawyers here think that um, the U.S.-China decoupling process may actually benefit Hong Kong because a lot of the Chinese companies that are listed in the United States will have to come back to Hong Kong. So actually, they, they, um, the, for, for, from the people that I've been talking to, they're not actually worried about uh, Hong Kong losing its uh, international uh, financial center status because uh, it will mean um, uh, different types of capital and business will come into Hong Kong. Great. Well, we're going to move to some of the questions from the audience now. If you still want to get your question in, please do so via the Q&A button. Um, first question is from Dalian Hamilton, who's an Australian public servant. Um, he wants to know, beyond words and public statements, what practical measures can the international community, including governments and NGOs, do to support Hong Kong? Um, Dennis, do you want to start there? What, what can the rest of the world do beyond you know, these many strongly worded statements? I think um, uh, if the Australian parliament and government should actively think about how to help the young people in Hong Kong, for those who wish to leave Hong Kong, wants a new life, um, I think the Australian government should actively think about ways in which channels could be opened up for, uh, especially for young people, but not exclusively, uh, for Hong Kong people to uh, go to Australia to study and work so as to give them a new uh, uh, a way of life. Now, I appreciate there are many young people here who are refusing to leave, but I'm talking about those who uh, have been convicted, uh, those who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, being chased by the authorities. Um, I think there should be a way out offered to them if they wish to leave. And I really I sincerely hope that the Australian government and uh, the parliament could think about ways to help these young people. And, and Bonnie, what's your view? I know you actually came over to Canberra last year to, to lobby Parliament about uh, Hong Kong's plight. What do you want to see the Australian government doing? Is offering sort of asylum enough? Do you think there should be targeted sanctions, which I know is something that the Parliament is currently considering? Um, I totally agree with what uh, Dennis had, had said. And on, to on top of that, I think uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, in the short term, uh, as we've discussed, the national security law could possibly be enacted in late June. And I think from now on to the actual enactment, uh, it is a very delicate period of time where we still haven't seen the draft of the bill. We still don't know what is, what is going to be like. So uh, I hope to think optimistically. I do not want to be a de defeatist yet. 
I uh, would like to think that if the world act in solidarity, if the pressure is enough, if the, uh, if the CCP is going to believe that the world is not going to just issuing statements, but would actually acknowledge that it is an unforgivable breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration and would be willing to act accordingly, then the CCP may have a second thought on how they will actually enact the law. And uh, it may turn out to be not as horrifying as we expect the law to be. So I believe that in the few, uh, next few weeks is, is very important. So for uh, Australian um, population supporters or NGOs or companies, um, I would urge you to talk to your politicians and join in a, a coalition in the world, uh, like the one that uh, Lord Patton is, is, is leading. Uh, there is a petition uh, urging parliamentarians to sign uh, that uh, to acknowledge the breach of uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration and subsequently urge uh, politicians to act accordingly. So I, I believe that is very important to uh, okay. well, when show you, solidarity. If, if I can interrupt, when you say act accordingly, but not just more statements. What does that mean? Do you want to see China sanctioned for this breach of the Sino-British Joint De Declaration? Um, that is one way. And uh, as Dana said, I believe uh, uh, open the doors for uh, political refugees from Hong Kong with open arms would be one uh, strong uh, statement to be, uh, or one strong message to be sending to CCP. And uh, on the other hand, uh, because there are always a lot of trade deals between, uh, no matter it's Australia, between Australia and Hong Kong, or Australia and China, uh, we may start making use of that uh, adding human rights clauses into it. Uh, that is one of the recommendations that I brought to Australian politicians. And I really hope that they would uh, consider it uh, more seriously in the future. And um, also, uh, uh, like the UK is also discussing about the 5G network that's supposed uh, to be uh, built uh, partly by uh, Huawei. And things like that, all of it uh, may be useful. And um, and I think the principle is very simple, is that if China can breach something as solemn and as important as the Sino-British Joint Declaration, they can breach basically every trade deals or every promises that they make. So it is not only about Hong Kong. So the question is really to Australians as well. If China is going to breach promise and deals with you, what you are going to do, you must use all of your resources in hand. You must reveal all of your foreign policies in order to give pressure to the other party to make sure that this is not acceptable and make sure that they will behave in the future. And now this is the time to act because this is not only the problem of Hong Kong, but uh, it is a, a really a value uh, versus um, uh, 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 it's about stopping the CCP's bullying behavior. So it is not about Hong Kong, it's about Australia as well. So use all of your tools, uh, urge your politicians to act as if it is a problem that is in, in Australia and re reveal all of your foreign policies. And if you're working in the, in the government, reveal your policies. And uh, if you're working in the companies, reveal your corporations policies as well to make sure that uh, you first of all you support Hong Kong, and at the same time you also make sure that the Chinese influence will not uh, uh, be on your territory and in your company in a way that uh, if you depend on China's benefits, then they'll have control over you, and we must stop that not only from the government's level, not only on the foreign policy level, but on all the corporations level, on all the media, on education system as well. Okay, well, I think that brings us really nicely to our next question, which is from Sam Davis, a teacher at the Wodonga Senior Secondary College. And I'll direct this to you, Sulin, if I may. Um, so Sam Davis asks, should companies operating in Hong Kong now treat the city in the same way they do mainland China in terms of intellectual property, cyber, political risks, etc.? I think we still haven't seen the details of the national security legislation. So um, 
it's hard to answer specifics regarding intellectual property law and cyber um, before that. That having been said, I think the, the long-term trend is clear and Hong Kong is becoming um, more and more like a mainland Chinese city. So I think for a lot of um, people operating here um, who do go back and forth between the mainland um, and uh, might be targets of the CCP, um, it's, it's seriously worth considering applying the same rules that you apply in mainland China to Hong Kong in terms of, for example, uh, your infosec um, and using, for example, more encrypted apps um, and uh, VPNs, things like that. We've already seen a huge uptick in um, the number of VPNs being downloaded in Hong Kong uh, just after the national security law was announced. Okay. Um, next question is from Dale Cohen, and he's referring to the fact that Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, has already offered uh, for up to three million Hong Kongers to have some form of sanctuary in the UK, potentially leading to citizenship. But the pathway isn't fully clear. Um, there's been pressure on Australia as well to offer something similar. Um, so I might direct this to you, Dennis. How, how do you think China is going to react to democratic countries offering sanctuary to Hong Kongers? And do you also feel that many Hong Kongers will want to take up these potential opportunities to leave their homeland uh, forever? You know, I grew up in Hong Kong uh, uh, in the, during the 80s and the 90s. So I've seen uh, the wave of emigration back then. It was one in every three families. Everyone back then was, 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 was leaving. I don't see the, the same kind of uh, sentiment now, to be honest. I, uh, a lot of people around me are thinking about having options, you know, having uh, uh, an exit plan, but a lot of them don't want to leave because um, uh, it, it is not easy to leave your hometown. And a lot of people don't want to leave our hometown. And they, as Bonnie said, they want to keep on with the struggle. Uh, and you know, to fight, fight until the, the, the last moment. So the, the feeling now is, I, I feel, it's not the same as back in the 90s and the 80s. But a lot of people are, uh, as I said, want to have an exit plan. And the thing about the BNO is that... Um, That's the British the National people, Overseas Passport that potentially would allow people to go to the UK. Um, a, a lot of young people are not qualified because if you were born here after 1997, so if you're 23 years or younger, then you, you might not get that option. So I, I urge the, the Australian government, as I said, to offer these young people a, a way out if they so choose to, to, to leave Hong Kong. And I think um, you, 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 you ask what is China going to do to uh, Western democracies who offer an exit plan? Oh, they will threaten you. They will uh, uh, bar uh, Australian beef and wine from uh, uh, going to China. So, but I think the world, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of um, uh, people have come to realize this is the consequence of having a uh, assertive uh, global power, uh, uh, you know, which is an authoritarian regime. I think EU, Canada, Australia, and the United States and other uh, uh, countries like Japan are now having to uh, face the consequence of uh, uh, China as it is today. And you have to choose between uh, fighting for your values, uh, values of democracy, freedom, and rule of law. And there are those people who don't believe in those values. And you need to uh, make a choice. I think as a people, as a country, you need to make a choice. Um, and the next question is a bit of crystal ball gazing. I might throw this back to you first, Dennis, too. Um, how do you envisage, this is from Gordon Arthur, how do you envisage Hong Kong could look like in five years from now? Will there be Chinese public security personnel on the streets, protests banned, extradition of dissenters to China, patriotic education in schools, a restricted internet, and reporters detained? Uh, not a very happy picture, but is it a likely scenario for five years on? I don't think you have to wait five years. Um, I think it could be next year when uh, what, what you described could be reality. We know the national security agents are already in Hong Kong. They are not operating openly, but they're here. We all know that, it's an open secret. Uh, and uh, will they start arresting people and bringing them across to China? I don't know. I wouldn't want to make that kind of prediction because a lot of people would have to leave Hong Kong. 
um, you know, there's this talk about whether there will be um, um, uh, retrospectivity uh, or retroactive uh, consequences with this national security law. Um, we don't know because if there is going to be retrospective effect of uh, criminal sanctions, which is of course in breach of all the basic human rights that we have in Hong Kong, but if there is going to be retrospective effect, millions of Hong Kong people would be living in fear and may have to leave because millions have joined protests, uh, have joined peaceful assemblies, or have set things on Facebook that could be used against them. So it would really drive fear uh, through the whole community. And there may be mass exodus. I don't know. Um, the next question is also for you, Dennis. Sorry to keep, uh, keep hogging your time. But it's from uh, Paul Lynch at Prudential. Um, what are you going to be looking out for in the details of the national security legislation when the draft law is published? And what would be an acceptable national security law for the pro-democracy camp? Now, I think um, a lot of people are looking at um, whether there will be still uh, the basic human rights protection that we've enjoyed in Hong Kong in this national security law. Are they going to be trying people in Hong Kong courts? in accordance with our legal system, with uh, our basic human rights uh, uh, guaranteed, or are they gonna be, the worst case scenario is that they would allow national security agents to arrest people in Hong Kong and then bring them across to China to face a criminal trial there. That would be the worst case scenario. Um, or is it gonna be uh, Hong Kong courts trying these uh, 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 cases? Do Hong Kong courts have jurisdictions over the national security law offenses? And also the very important question of retrospectivity. Uh, under the uh, 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 Hong Kong Constitution and our Bill of Rights, there cannot be uh, retrospective criminal offenses. And that is an absolute you know, uh, rule with very, very few exceptions or none at all. Um, so I think we will be looking out at those um, uh, 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 elements and also uh, whether our freedom of expression or freedom of conscience will be affected. Does it mean that if I say uh, 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 freedom of express, uh, you know, uh, uh, free Hong Kong or whatever, Hong Kong independence, I will be arrested just by mere expression? And also one last very important element is they keep saying that they want to outlaw foreign interference in Hong Kong. Now, that's a very uh, uh, strange concept for those of us who are trained in the common law. What is foreign interference? And how are you going to outlaw it? Um, of course, they don't like uh, uh, the United States Congress passing legislation like the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. They see, see that as foreign interference. But it would be very interesting to see what is it that they're going to do to outlaw foreign interference. Now, in Hong Kong, in our parliament, in, in, in the Legislative Council, we receive MPs, members of Congress, foreign officials all the time. The pro-establishment is there and the Dem Democrats are there and we have meetings, we talk about Hong Kong, we talk about the world, we talk about world affairs all the time. Now, obviously they see that as foreign interference, but Hong Kong is an international city. We talk to people all the time. I talk to council generals, uh, I talk to foreign businesses, uh, foreign journalists uh, and you know, conversations like this kind uh, with lower institute. Is this foreign interference? Is this kind of conversation going to be illegal going forward? Hong Kong will cease to function, I tell you, if they try to outlaw, uh, you know, um, conversations of this kind and interaction between us and foreign officials, foreign MPs. Um, I think those are the things that the international community should really look out for. Because if they want to outlaw this kind of interaction, then the, you know, the, then the light will be switched off on Hong Kong and, uh, uh, you know, there will be effectively a firewall between us and the rest of the world and uh, the international community will completely lose Hong Kong. We're almost out of time, unfortunately. I'm going to squeeze in one more question, which is from Chris Champion, who's a publisher. Um, he wants to ask about the Hong Kong police, and I might direct this to you, Su Ling, because I think you've done some reporting on this, but what's been the impact of the protests and the change in public sentiment over the last year on the police, which has really gone from being liked and respected in Chris's words to being reviled. Um, has that had an impact on, on the police? And, and what does that mean for, for Hong Kong going forward when there's such distrust between the police and the public? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's great. a great question. I think one of the lasting tragic effects of the 2019 Hong Kong protests has been this breakdown in trust between um, protesters and Hong Kong's institutions. So previously, there were very high levels of trust um, towards a lot of Hong Kong institutions from Hong Kong people, for example, police force, um, which is known, used to be known as Asia's finest, um, all the way to, say, the Subway Corporation, the MTR, um, at, that have all been seen now to be um, acting at the behest of, of the Hong Kong government and Beijing. Um, and I think what, what is really sad is that in a liberal democracy, the police are accountable to the government, but the government are ultimately accountable to the people um, who can vote in and out their government, um, who can request, who can ask for policy changes, who can ask for um, uh, changes in the head of the police force, for example. But we don't have that. There, is that, there isn't that system in Hong Kong because um, it isn't a democracy and the people of Hong Kong don't get to um, elect their government um, in the way that we understand it in the West. Um, and so I think there was a lot of anger um, at the police force last year from the protesters um, because of um, how they were acting. Um, and there was also this sense that there was no way for the, the people of Hong Kong to hold the police to account. And so we saw, um, I think it was, there was a public opinion poll that saw uh, levels of trust in the police force plummet to zero for 51% of people polled um, as the protests escalated um, later last, late last year. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's I, I don't really see how trust is going to be rebuilt. Um, not only with the police force, but, but also with um, Hong Kong institutions more broadly. And on top of that, now that there is um, this impending national security legislation where it's very possible that um, China's secret police, uh, uh, Ministry of State Security is going to be able to operate openly um, and legally in Hong Kong, that, that trust in, in both the Hong Kong police and uh, China's secret police is, is is going to plummet even further. Well, thanks, Sulin, um, Bonnie, and Dennis for taking the time today to discuss this really important topic. It's been um, informative, but certainly unsettling, and that reflects the realities I think that people are facing in, in Hong Kong now. But thanks once again for your time. Please check our website for details of future events. Um, and in the meantime, from all of us at the Lowy Institute, thank you for joining us today, and please stay well.